So the prayer room that is open upstairs in Hope Hall, Wednesday nights from 6.30. Also, we have a prayer for some who would like to share after worship. If you need someone down front, you can go to the prayer room. Also, would like to announce that our own Jennifer Roberts will participate in a panel discussion entitled From the Capital to Communities, Inside State and Local Climate Policy. This will happen during the WFA Climate Summit at UNC on April 18th from 11.30 a.m. until 12.15 p.m. So I hope you will take advantage of that. Family, we were asking for visitors. Uh, one of my visitors who came in did not hear that, so I'm going to call them out. <laughs> Sisters, Marilyn and Marielle Matthews. Marilyn is from Columbia, South Carolina. So now I pour out my heart to you Here in your presence I am made new So now I pour out my heart to you. I give you my heart, Lord. Here in your presence, I am made new. You know my name. You know my name. You know my name. Yes, you do, Lord. You know my name. Amen. 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 I invite you now to join me in our call to worship. 
printed in our bulletin. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We have not seen the risen Christ. We have not seen Jesus face to face. But we have seen him in the faces of everyone whose love encourages us. We have not touched the wounds from the cross. But we have been called to bring healing to the heart of the world. Let us pray. God of mercy and love, we invite your spirit into this place. God, send your love and your peace to these, your people, as we come to offer our praise and our gratitude. Enfold us, Lord, in your abundant grace as we sing together, as we pray together, as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Lord, be with those who are here in person and those who are worshiping virtually. Give us the wisdom and the courage to hear and to live in the way of Jesus. We thank you for this time together as one body in Christ, in whose holy name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning, we have come into this house. The words are printed in the bulletin. Friends, on the one hand, given the events of the morning, I suppose it's easy for us to enter this time of confession with a us versus them mentality. To write them off. And maybe assume a little bit too much about us and our need for confession. And while the world is a, a broken and sometimes hurtful place, the way we heal it is to look within ourselves honestly and to ask what God would change, not in them, but in us. And so with that in mind, I invite us to say together our words of our prayer of confession, saying, Risen Christ, we are often troubled by our doubts, but you are not troubled by them. 
You do not require perfect understanding. Instead, you reveal yourself to us again and again that we might come to know you. Forgive us when our doubts keep us stuck, when fear prevents us from loving all creation as you call us to do. Help us to accept the peace you so graciously offer to us. Have mercy on us when we hoard or hide it, when we fail to offer it to others. Renew us and make us whole that in this world of strife we may be bearers of your peace. In resurrection, hope we pray. Amen. And God invites us to confess personally and silently. Amen. Friends, the amazing truth of God's grace is this. God sees us as pure as this little boy and as clean as his greeting to us today. And so in the name of Christ, I share the best news you'll hear this day or any day. We are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with each of you. If you need a particular hug this morning or are a little bit more shaken by this cruel world than usual, you're invited to come down and Anne promises to give you a hug. <laughs> Let's share this peace.
justice, justice demanded. Oh Lord, that I should die. Grace and mercy said, Oh no, oh no, no, no. We've already paid the price. I, I once was blind, but I thank God, I thank God that I can see. Cause your grace and mercy came along, came along, and it rescued, it rescued me. Your grace, your grace and mercy brought me through, brought me through. Live in this moment, live in this moment because, because of you. Amen and amen. I am told that uh, we might have run out of bulletins. Do we have anybody who uh, needs a bullet? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Everybody got what they need? Okay. Thank you. I've got to use one myself. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely job, choir and Joan. I don't ever hear that song that I don't think of our friend Wilma Petty, but she would have loved it. Thank you. When Ann called me this week to remind me about of a, that I was reading the scripture today, but also to say that it was not a mistake that we were having the same scriptures as last week, I couldn't help but think of this young pastor who made his way into this town and you be there he preached a sermon that must have been magnificent because people talked about it throughout the week great anticipation was in the congregation when the next week he mounted the pulpit preached the same sermon again <laughs> the third week he did the same thing and the fourth week <laughs> Some of the members of the congregation said, Preacher, we really appreciate that sermon, but don't you have a new one? He said, do something about the first one, and I will move on <laughs> to the next one. So Dot, I assume that we will do better. I hope we will do better. The first scripture today is from Psalms, and the second is from John. They are, again, what we heard last week. But beforehand, join me in a prayer of illumination. Inspired by that beloved hymn, breathe on us, one and all, O breath of God. Fill us with life anew. May we love what you love and do what you would have us do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing life forevermore. And from John 20, the evening of the resurrection. And when it was evening of that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
After this he said, had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the Lord's disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out and put your hand in my side. But Thomas answered him, Lord, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Friends, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Can I have all my young folks to come on down? Let's go! screaming people out there. Did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. And they said some things that were not nice, especially me and Pastor John. They're just me, 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 me. Why do they do something like that? I'm going to ask the congregation out here, have you ever been so mad and felt you were so right that you screamed out some things you ought not to have screamed? <laughs> Yes. Yes. It has happened to me too. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been really mad? Just yell! Ah! Yes, sometimes. Yes. So we all maybe scream the wrong thing from time to time. But we were reminded in the sto story, which we talked about last week, that Jesus, when he was confronted with someone who did not believe what, that he has, was resurrected, he went to their house and yelled really loud at them, right? No, he was kind. He met the person that doubted him, and he was kind, and he showed him, I am Jesus, I am the man that you know. And he met that problem with love. And this is just another example of people that we get to meet with love, even when they are a little screamier than they ought to be today. <laughs> well, I can tell you for sure that there will be a ton of love downstairs, when you get to learn what we're going to learn today. So can stand it on up and let's head on down. And as we say each week, May the Lord be with you here. All right. Amen. take just a moment to
Thank you, Caldwell, for your radical hospitality to me and to Linda over the last mm, about four months now, I think it is. Uh, we've seen the magic here at Caldwell, the wonderful ministries that you have, and we are excited about being a part of that. So thank each of you for all you've done for us and with us during these past few months. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. We gather again today to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Eastertide presents another opportunity for us to proclaim the awesome act of God in raising the crucified Christ from the grave. In the reading of the Psalms, David wrote that it is good and pleasant for God's people to live together in the unity. And that is what we aspire as we prepare to welcome our neighbors to Easter's home, that we, the Caldwell congregation, the community, and the residents of Easter's home would live in harmony and goodwill made possible by God's power and God's grace. Now last Sunday, our pastor, this John, delivered a powerful sermon from the Gospel of John entitled, What's the Harm? In the scriptural passage, Jesus is confronted with one of the disciples, Thomas, who refuses to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And Justin, in telling the story of our, to our children this week and last week, said that Jesus could have behaved in many ways. Jesus could have become angry with Thomas. He could have told Thomas that he could no longer be a disciple. He could have walked away. Now, I'm sure some of you who are astute scholars have noticed that this scripture is the same as last week's scripture. Jeff has already pointed that out. And you probably said, well, you know, since John and Dot are beyond 20, they probably <laughs> forgot. <laughs> they probably didn't know, and Anne didn't notice it either, that this was the same scripture from last week. Well, we are past 20 a little bit, but we didn't forget. It's intentional that we use the same scripture because we wanted to continue the conversation from last week. So I would ask that you continue to think about the question that John posed last week. What is the harm? What is the harm as we prepare to welcome our siblings to Easter's home, and as we fellowship with one another and our siblings in the community. Let's look back for just a moment to that morning when the women went to the tomb and found it empty. Jesus appeared and instructed them to go and tell the disciples that he, Jesus, had risen just as he said he would. Now, there were some who doubted, and last week John shared with us the response that Jesus gave to one of the doubters, Thomas. Now we criticize Thomas and we talk about his unbelief, but I believe this. If one of our members passed away on Monday and we were here today, and that member came in the church and stood in the center aisle, there might be a little doubt. 
as to whether that person or that whatever standing in the aisle was our deceased member. So I think we can understand Thomas's doubt. He just wasn't sure. And doubt is not an anomaly. We all have doubt. In his book, Grace Can Lead Us Home, Kevin Nye notes that doubt has been around for a while. He said, some people doubted whether God being eternal and divine could die and still be God. Later, the question became, is resurrection metaphysically and analytically intelligible? Is it possible? Is it, could, it, could it be true? So Thomas's doubt is not an outlier. If we're honest, we too have doubt. We have doubt about a lot of things we read in the Bible. But the good news, church, is this. Jesus meets us in the midst of our doubt. And he speaks to Thomas using the words that Jeff spread in the scripture. Peace be with you. The gospel writer John wants us to know that Jesus met Thomas. In fact, Jesus sought Thomas out to assure Thomas that Jesus was present with Thomas and the other disciples in the midst of Thomas's doubt. And Jesus will be in the midst of our neighbors who will be moving into Easter's home. They will see the same Jesus who came to find Thomas. Now that Jesus may be in the form of a volunteer from our church who brings warm muffins to our guest. That, that Jesus may be in the form of a social worker who helps with counseling for paperwork to, for the person to receive veterans benefits. That Jesus may be a member of our pastoral staff joining in a prayer service organized by the residents of Easter's home. Now the residents may not recognize that it is Jesus working through us, but that does not diminish the relationship that is evolving. As John pointed out last week, the emphasis on the story in scripture is not so much the doubt that Thomas had, but it is about the response that Jesus had to Thomas's doubt. You see, church, the Gospel of John is about Jesus, and it is spelled out in verse 31. It says that these, meaning the miracles and signs that Jesus performed, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So as we translate Jesus' compassion and understanding to our response to our soon-to-be neighbors, the question arises. When our neighbors exhibit behaviors that conflict with our beliefs or our customs or our biases, what is the harm? What is the harm? If we respond with cynicism and blame and fear, what is the harm? Or if we respond with love and compassion and understanding, what is the harm? Before answering these questions, even rhetorically, let us pause to consider the similarities that our neighbors may have with Thomas. They may come with doubt, doubts about who we are. They may come believing that we are a bunch of people who are seeking to make a name for ourselves in the religious community. They may come doubting that we actually care about them, their hopes, and their dreams, but rather we want to impose our values and our customs on them. They may come with doubts about our willingness to see them for who they really are, children of God. But Caldwell, we are called in this season of ministry to understand that our siblings who will live in Easter's home will come with doubts that may result from trauma. Trauma? Well, Nye in his book describes trauma as the result of exposure to an incident or series of events that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects 
on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Did you get that? It affects everything. Trauma affects every aspect of a person's being. Most people experience some form of trouble, trauma, in their lifetime. So it shouldn't surprise us that our neighbors who will live in Easter's home are likely to have experienced some traumatic experience at one time or another. Now we tend to view trauma as something violent or a serious illness or accident, but it need not be. Living on the streets for months or years, not having your own bed, not being able to go into the kitchen and make a sandwich, not having a way to receive mail, things we often take for granted can and do over time induce trauma. Remember the definition, exposure to an incident or a series of events that are emotionally disturbing or life-threatening and leave adverse effects. Mm -hmm. So when we meet our neighbors, especially at times when the trauma that they carry around exposes itself in unkind ways, when these adverse effects cause disruptive or disturbing behavior, we are called to respond to Jesus, as Jesus responded to Thomas. We are called to meet our neighbors in the moment, in the midst of their pain, and ask, what is the harm? What is the harm? We may consider that this person is responding to something that we have no knowledge of, but we are called to respond with kindness and grace. Now that is not to say that safety is not important. It is. But we must learn to balance safety with compassion and grace. And we hope you will join us tomorrow evening from 6 to 9 for a webinar, Introduction to Harm Reduction, which will include an exploration between risk and trauma the dangers of shame and isolation, and the impact that stigma has on vulnerable populations. And you'll hear about this concept of trauma-informed care. And this has met great success, it says, in social work. But somehow the church has been rather slow in developing this hmm. practice. Hmm. Does that seem odd? <laughs> but in the meek weeks and months to come, we will be hearing and learning much more about trauma-informed care and learning to employ this practice with our neighbors at Easter's home and with one another. Nye, in his book, notes that trauma-informed care meets people amid their brokenness and pain as Christ modeled, but it also emphasizes a spirit of collaboration and empowerment. A spirit of collaboration and empowerment meets people amidst their brokenness. Think about this. Thomas approached the living God with doubt. Thomas said to his siblings, unless my hand, unless I put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. But Jesus met Thomas in his brokenness, in his doubt. Jesus collaborated with Thomas by inviting Thomas to come closer. Jesus invited Thomas to put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus' actions and Jesus' words empowered Thomas, who responded, my Lord and my God. The neighbors we meet at Easter's home will present with brokenness and pain. The traumas that they bring may be hidden from plain view, but may manifest themselves in a number of behaviors. Our response what is the harm? If we respond to our neighbors with a lack of compassion, part of the harm is that 
they are further traumatized and moved further away from wholeness and well-being. But my friends, we are also harmed if we are unable to meet our neighbors where they are. What's the harm? Well, how about missed opportunities to learn about their pain and their brokenness? Their brokenness. What about ways to find ways to help them cope and live life on life's terms? You see, trauma is a deep-rooted condition. It can last for years, even a lifetime. When I worked prosecuting parents and others who abused children and older adults, I attended a conference in New Orleans about five or six years after Hurricane Katrina. I attended a panel discussion about the impact that the hurricane had had on the children of New Orleans. Some of the children were experiencing nightmares. Others had fallen behind in school. Some exhibited antisocial behaviors that had not existed prior to the storm. Many children received counseling, but many did not. And those children are grown now. But it is safe to say that some of them continue to carry the trauma of August 23rd, 2005. What's the harm of seeing people beyond their behavior? Well, Caldwell, we miss the opportunity to share the love of Jesus Christ and to transform lives and to be transformed. Transforming the lives of our neighbors occurs on the outside with physical enhancements. Life, a permanent home, security, community, and fellowship. The significance of supporting houses, housing is not a pipe dream. It's not a theory concocted by a group of social scientists in a university setting. The model which we will use for Easter's home called Housing First is backed by empirical data. Providing supportive housing has proven to cut cost of homelessness. In fact, it cuts it in half. Eight out of 10 people remain housed after three years. There are fewer arrests made when people are given houses, some 50 to 70 percent. Several years ago, I served as a municipal judge in my hometown, Rock Hill, South Carolina. And on Monday mornings, many of the cases I heard involved loitering, trespassing, public intoxication, and other minor offenses, due in part because most of the folks who came before the court were unhoused. To some, jail was a welcome place because it was safe and there would be three meals and a roof over their heads. I didn't see jail as a good option, but sometimes I sensed that jail was the best alternative. But what if there had been supportive housing? What if these folk had not been walking around on other people's property looking for some way to heal their pain? I suspect that many of them would not have shown up in the courtroom. And as we move through our congregational listening sessions, we will hear more about housing first. But more importantly than physical transformation, the people living at Easter's home will be transformed on the inside. Our neighbors will have opportunities to get in touch with their emotional selves, learning to listen, learning to forgive, they will be able to live in an environment which allows them to be vulnerable, to express joy and sadness in healthy ways, and to show empathy to others. Our neighbors will have opportunities to learn trust, to communicate, and to seek and develop a relationship with God. Caldwell, Easter's home will also transform us. As we get to know our neighbors and as we walk alongside them, as we all journey home, we too will have opportunities to learn and practice forgiveness, to listen, 
to feel what others feel, to love others who may have never crossed our paths, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable, to trust God more fully. The theologian Richard Rohr notes that transformation is more than a change of mind, but a change at the very heart of the way you receive, hear, and pass in each moment. Rohr sums up spiritual transformation in four steps. Cleaning up, growing up, waking up, and showing up. Cleaning up, growing up waking up and showing up. And there's no timetable. Each person's journey is different. But as we focus on our goal, as articulated in Psalm 133, to live together in unity, we can be assured that we are living into our God-given purpose. As Jesus saw Thomas, we are called to see our neighbors, to see beyond their physical characteristics and to see their humanity through our spiritual lens. Mm. We're called to see their pain, to see their gifts, to see their hopes and their dreams. We're called to see their need for community, their need to be seen and to be heard and to be understood. But get this part we are called to invite them to see us, to see who we are, to see our own brokenness, our own failures, our own traumas, to see how our church and other churches have been complicit in many ways that have contributed to their pain and their brokenness and to seek forgiveness. We are called to invite them to see our love for them as siblings for whom Christ died and as siblings with whom Jesus walks as we all journey home. We are called to seek unity, to seek the well-being of all, to build community based on the promises of Jesus. And may it be so. Amen. I'm going to say something that might be on all of your minds, and I'll do it as a personal privilege. But did God know what she was doing in sending us Doc Killing? God has, God has embraced this ministry quickly and deeply, as if she had been walking these last 10 years with us on it. And she already is illuminating our path in some important ways. As to her message, friends, it's traumatic to be homeless in America. It's traumatic to be black in America. We all know our own traumas. This is not anything that is foreign to us. And as Dodd has said, how ironic that the social scientists figured out trauma-informed care before the church did. God gives us a new chance. Let us take a moment and think about that. And where we'll be tomorrow night. And where we'll be in a year when we welcome our 21 neighbors to Easter's home.
Now we respond to the word of the Lord in multiple ways. First we sing, lead me, guide me, hymn 740, and we uh, invite those who would like to bring their contributions for 10 cents a meal, which does go to feed hungry and homeless children among others. standing I invite you to grab your bulletin it was about 17 years ago when God had a different notion than this close this church should close that we talked about what we would like to create and our mission statement is captured by that and its authors are here with us and we're grateful for that I've always been grateful to them Jeff and Toby this is an aspirational statement, friends. We haven't arrived yet. And so let us turn to the back page of our bulletin and state what we believe and what we seek to do. We seek to build a diverse, intentional, affirming community animated by joyful worship and called forth into social action for service to the greater good. We seek to hear God's call, not only as individuals, but as a progressive, missional community striving to reflect the kingdom of God in the here and now. We embrace the rich history of the Reformed tradition and the storied past of our Central City Church as we welcome a diverse community of seekers all ages, races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, cultural and economic backgrounds, gender identities, and family structures, all people. We are called into a meaningful, transformative that values the unique blessings and perspectives of each member and offers a place of welcome and healing to weary souls. We seek dynamic servant leaders who serve humbly, embrace change, and boldly challenge injustices in the wider community. Most important, we seek to proclaim the gospel in both word and deed, following the life and the teachings 
of the risen Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, now we are invited to share a portion of our tithes and offerings. What comes from God, we return to God. Jesus came into the place and said it twice because we need to hear it. Peace be with you. And so with this offering and with our lives, as we turn to go back out into a hurting world, a world where people may shout, but that you offer to heal. With the words of the psalmist, we celebrate this community, how very good it is when kindred live together in unity. Take these, our offerings, our lives, our time, and our talent. Remind us of the hurt in the world 
and make us wounded healers. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. And we, I'm sorry, let's pray the Lord's Prayer as well. Let us use the words that Jesus gave us to pray, saying, Our Father, O Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And now, friends, let us sing hymn 300. Vic Vicardo, would you check and give us a thumbs up or thumbs down about whether or not our friends are still there? All right. Let us sing hymn 300. We are one in spirit. to acknowledge a beautiful picture made by the children that says, this is the day the Lord has made. Thank you, John and Dot, the Caldwell kids. Thank you, Caldwell kids. Please now receive the charge and benediction. Let us pray for wisdom and peace as we pursue justice and love for all. And what does the Lord require of us but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God? We are Easter people building Easter's home for our siblings with whom we will live and work and fellowship and worship the God of all humankind. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love and the power of Almighty God 
and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Louder. Yeah.